The AK-47, the real weapon of mass destruction. It kills more people than uh, the atomic bomb it has. And we'll continue to do that. It's used by about 50 different armies. My assault rifle is being used only in wars inside a country. Perhaps Mikhail Kalashnikov takes solace in the belief that his invention isn't being used by nations to invade other nations. But those internal conflicts he refers to can be just as deadly. And the AK-47 makes it possible for small guerrilla forces to wreak havoc in a society. The military term for it is asymmetrical warfare. Charles Taylor in Liberia, he literally took over the country with 100 men armed with AKs and a few other weapons. He held the country in his grip for over 10 years in a very clever way that had never been done before. And what he did was he gave cheap AKs to anybody who would swear allegiance to him and say, okay, go out and cause mayhem. Charles Taylor got those cheap AKs from a number of international arms dealers. Chief among them, Victor Boot. Boot had a fleet of planes that delivered arms to whomever would pay. When the United States leaves a war zone, they generally don't take their munitions. This 2005 film, The Lord of War, starring Nicolas Cage, is based on Boots' life and exploits. How many kilos would you like? 5,000. I'm interested in uh, aviation. It was in aviation. That's understating it a bit. Richard Shosakli is a Syrian-born, naturalized American citizen, now living in Moscow because he says two years ago the United States government FBI and Treasury agents raided his home and office in Texas, seized his property, and accused him of being a major player in Victor Boot's illegal gun running operation. They took charges, oh. my office, my evidence, my documents, everything I have is something they have. They had it since uh, 2005, the beginning of 2005, and yet there is nothing charged, no charges, no crime, nothing. What's your allegation, though? Allegation that I'm um, an accountant, I think, or associate of Victor Boot. Is that the case? Uh, the answer is no. He also denies a United Nations report that says he worked for Boot, even though he's offered publicly on his website to deliver Boot to the authorities. It says that I've been his employee for 10 years. I haven't got a dollar from the man. Then, abruptly, Shoshakli changes his mind and acknowledges his close relationship with Boot. Victor Boot uh, was a friend, and uh, I considered him a brother. And all I know about his business is something I learned in my position as uh, I was a commercial manager. My responsibility include the review of financial documents. And finally, he admits he did set up an airline in Texas for Boot. He advised me that he has an entity. It's called San Air, and that San Air can have a branch. San Air was based at Sharjah in the United Arab Emirates, a busy cargo center and free trade zone considered ideal for arms dealers. So uh, I created San Air uh, on his behalf. A United Nations report says that payments for Victor Boots Liberia dealings in 2001 went to the San Air bank accounts in Texas. Whether San Air has any business that's questionable done anywhere else in the world, that could be true. We asked that Shoshakli make good on his boast, that he set us up with Victor Boot so we could ask him about his arms trading empire, about the tons of AK-47s he flew to Africa, Afghanistan, and Iraq. But unbelievably, Shoshakli claims that the man called the merchant of death for the tens of millions of dollars he made is now almost penniless, and that he no longer grants interviews. He is truly driving a Toyota Camry. The point that Shoshakli really wants to make is that governments are the bad guys. I do not believe that individuals are responsible for shipping any arms in significant quantity or frequency anywhere in the world. I think governments are sponsoring these activities. A global terrorism analysis report titled Victor Boot from International Outlaw to Valued Partner claims that Boot's work flying supplies into Baghdad for U.S. military forces earned him the gratitude of the Bush administration, and a promise that the multitude of international charges against him would be dropped. The Belgian court just dropped the case against uh, Victor Boot about a month ago for lack of evidence. Larry Kahaner says it's almost impossible to track illegal sales of AK-47s to say whether it's a government selling or an individual. 
probably 80, 90 percent, maybe even more, of illegal weapons trafficking starts out as legal, where weapons will go to an army and then sort of get sidetracked or you know, leaked out and will end up in the hands of, of paramilitary groups. It may be difficult to untangle who is paying the bills, but the fact that millions of AKs have been sold to African fighters and used to arm child soldiers is indisputable. I was actually a child soldier for over two years. Ishmael Beya is 26 now. His experiences as a child soldier in Sierra Leone in 1994, when he was only 13, are chronicled in his book, A Long Way Gone. He says his AK was the difference between life and death. Very afraid of it, uh, to hold it, or to look at it even. Um, I was very nervous, I was shaking, but I had no choice, you know, if I didn't hold it or use it, I was going to be killed. I am baby killer. The horrors of that life were depicted in the film Blood Diamond. For Ishmael, scenes like these aren't fiction. He lived them. They just teach you how to uh, put the magazine in, you know, you know, cuff the gun and shoot. We were trained less than a week. In my group, there were seven kids who were nine years old. At nine years old, they could use the AK-47? Uh, yes, yes. And also, not only is it easy to use, it's also not as heavy. Some kids in my squad who were not as strong, who the gun was almost taller than, but they can carry it, uh, drag it. So a a AK-47 is so simple, a, a child could use it? AK-47 is very, that's one of the reasons why, you know, these civil wars uh, um, continue on. Ishmael says that as their time in the jungle went on, their feelings about the gun were transformed. I didn't part with my gun at all. When I slept, it was next to me. We became so attached to it because in this context, this is what guaranteed you life. It became your power, actually. So you felt very special holding this AK-47. So the weapon actually became like your, your protector, provider, and your power in this context. So when we went out and fought and you know, destroyed villages and killed other combatants, we um, took their weapons from them. So also acquiring more weapons was also a, a, a kind of sense of pride. Where were these weapons coming from? How common were they in the area? The AK-47s were very common. I'm not sure exactly where they were coming from exactly, but uh, you know, I'm sure there were some Chinese brands, there were some Russian brands. Child soldiers are cut off from what they knew and transformed into killing machines. And so for me, after I had lost my entire family, they were killed, you know, two, uh, two brothers and mother and father. I, I lost hope in actually um, everything. And then you train, you, you, you know, briefly you shoot the AK-47, you know, you begin to slightly enjoy it, but you're not sure. And then when you really go to battle the first time and you shoot and kill somebody, it does something to who you are. It changes, changed me from what I had been as a kid. As I was running away from this war, people were being killed and amputated in different ways and just paths littered with dead bodies and rivers filled with floating dead bodies and blood. And, and the more I fought myself not to think, the worse it got. Wherever child soldiers are used, these things become very statistic because in order, in order for you to, to recruit a child and to press them into a conflict, to brainwash them, you have to destroy what they know so they become attached to you. Ishmael was eventually rescued by UNICEF, but amazingly, he found he missed his AK. I miss not being in control, not having the weapon and doing what I like. Could you actually be a child again? Yeah. It's very possible. The process is difficult. It's not as easy as some people make it seem. You know, you don't remove the kid from the war and they're fine. When you left, were you addicted to drugs as well? Oh, yeah. One of the things that we did to numbers to Spain was taking drugs. And the drugs that we took ranged from marijuana, alcohol to cocaine to brown brown, which is a mixture of gunpowder and cocaine. So it was just madness, you know. Larry Kahaner says the AK is ideal for child soldiers because marksmanship doesn't count. With an AK, you can just give that to a child and say, go out and cause mayhem, and they'll cause mayhem. And you can do what soldiers call spray and pray, which is you just fire it in, in one direction and you can get six to 700 rounds per minute and you'll hit something. Perfect for a nine-year-old who's brainwashed drugged up, terrified, alienated, and sometimes feeling all-powerful. The only export Russia may be more famous for than the AK-47 is vodka. The latest variation of the AK-47 is a bottle full of vodka 
that the marketer's claim is an exclusive formula created by Kalashnikov himself. But when I presented it to him, his reaction was, well, explosive. It is an outrage. I don't approve of it. Rifles are not supposed to be filled with spirits. The AK-47, defender of the motherland, weapon of mass destruction, conveyor of high-octane vodka. At 60, it's as durable and beloved as its creator.